So eligibility. So we're moving into eligibility. I noticed there's a lot of questions in the chat that are related to eligibility. We're getting there, right? We're getting there. So we're following the journey. We started with what is child care financial assistance? We moved to what is the like, what are the steps for the family and the family journey? Get to know who your family is. What are their needs? How you can help them? Then we talked about wait lists, right? How do families come on the wait list? How are they navigating through the wait list, right? How do you pull them? And now we're going to talk about eligibility, right? What happens once that family um, is contacted, once they receive that funding availability letter or, or they reach us um, in another way? and eligibility, what's new? So we're gonna go over what's new. What's new is that we are now defining full-time care as 25 hours or more for a week, right? We know that that system change has not been updated in CCFA yet. So um, in order to do this, it requires you probably putting in seeking care or, um, or adding transportation if they're eligible. Income requirement, income requirement, um, for homeless families waived. So homeless families now have no income requirement, right? And that limit of two years is gone, right? We, mo we know most families are not eligible. Most families are um, homeless with our um, rents, our high rents. They're homeless for longer. For some families, they're homeless longer than the two years. So we removed that. We shifted the term teen parent. We're now using young parent. And young parent um, is actually a term that is used with our other partner agencies across the state. And we've also increased the eligibility up to 24, um, up to 24 years of age, which aligns with our other agencies as well. Homeless, domestic violence, and substance abuse treatment, they qualify as a service need and a service activity. What that means is families who are experiencing homelessness, DV, or substance abuse, they will not need like another service. Um, they won't need like another service activity hours to be eligible for full-time care. Uh, provisionals. So we know provisionals are shifting. We're changing the time period for provisionals from 12, from 26 weeks to 12 months. This change has not happened yet. We will not make the change to the 12 week provisionals until CCFA has been updated to allow for full-time care at 25 hours. So the change that will happen for provisionals is it will be 12 weeks and we'll be limiting it to two, a maximum of two provisionals in a 12 month period. This is a big shift for our families. We know that since COVID, many of those, many of our families um, have received consecutive provisionals um, and unlimited provisionals for the last two to three years. We want to ensure that we're communicating with families of this change. And so we're going to wait to shift that until we are able to communicate families. We anticipate. Um, changing the provisionals probably at the new year. And we've extended the amount of weeks that a family can submit income. So family can submit income up to 12, 26 weeks. And um, what that basically does, it just allows for them to provide us on consecutive pay stubs within 26 weeks. They won't have to resubmit um, income within those 26 weeks if they have a hard time finding care. We remove child support, in-kind child support, TFDC, SSI, um, and SSDI um, to countable income. So those incomes are no longer countable. Those will be updated in CCFA. They've already been updated on our parent fee calculator on our website, and they will be updated uh, in Kinderweight as well. We made a, we made a shift to self-employment self families that are self employed they will now only be they will only have to submit one month of income right one month of income and they will not need to provide receipts or expenses so we'll talk self employment we'll we'll talk about it very briefly today and then we'll have a more uh, deep dive into self employment during the provider journey and uh, just a little slower, if you can, Tyrese. Oh, so, sorry. yeah, sorry. it's very, it's a lot moving. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. 
also for um, employment, right? F families who were newly employed, they were able to submit an employment verification letter, right? Or they could submit an employment verification form and they would be eligible for provisional. Now they're gonna be eligible for a 12 month authorization. Those families will get to choose. They can either choose the 12 month authorization or they can choose the provisional if they're starting a new job and provide a letter or they've submitted the employment verification form. And then our active family, our active military leave deployed families, they um, are gonna be eligible whether they are the parent who's deployed or the parent who is home. So their service activity will actually be actively deployed military. Is self-employment of one month in effect now? It will be in effect after you've gotten the full training. Uh, so that will be, so that that would be not yet. Uh, it, it's, it, it requires, of course, it's going to require technical training on how you do it. CCFA also has not been updated yet for the self-employment piece. And then the changes that are we that have been made to service needs is graduate school is now a service need only at reassessment, right? We're only at reauthorization and if education was a previous service need. Excuse me, Tyrese. Sure. Um, I just wanted to mention CCFA is only requiring one month for self-employed now. Oh, it's working already. Well, you're ahead yes, of us. I just haven't trained you on it. So I would, um, we can talk about it when we get to self-employment. How about that? We can talk about it once we get to self-employment. That works. That works. That works. Thank um, you. You're welcome. 10 college credits is considered full-time. And so, you know, you just multiply 10 by 2.5, 2 you get your 25 hours, which is full-time care. We know that CCFA isn't updated yet to accept, um, to recognize the 25 hours as full-time care. So what you actually have to do is um, give the families um, a provisional if they don't have another service need that you can add. For parental, Parental leave is now uh, the term we're using for maternity or paternity leave. And it is a service need that will be eligible for a 12 month authorization. That's a change. And we're making that change because provisionals are gonna shift to 12 weeks. And we know that most families are taking longer than 12, uh, longer than 12 weeks for their paternity leave. And then the last change um, is disability of parent can be combined with another service name. Is that better? All right. So, and changes in relation to documentation, we're updating. At, we're updating all our forms. We're updating all our forms so that they um, are fillable PDF and. Um, here is just highlighting the ones that will you'll see some you'll see more updates to which are disability of parent, disability of child, our change form, our employment verification, and all of our other forms. And then we're adding a self attestation form, right? We know that for some of our families, it's challenging for them to collect different types of documentation. So we will be implementing um, the self attestation for those families. We've removed um, the household comp the requirement of the household composition form, as well as the household income statement and the third party verification form. So the household composition and the household income statement, the information that is collected in those will actually now be collected through the new child care financial assistance application. So once you're trained on the child care financial assistance application, you will no longer be required to collect those forms. And no one should currently be using the third party verification form, right? The third party verification form should be torn up, torn into pieces and thrown in the rubbish. We're no longer using that. Our disability of parent documentation, we've shifted it. It used to be you had to have the form in the letter. Now it's either the letter or the form, either one. We're no longer requiring you to use Google Maps to verify five hours of travel time for families um, seeking, for families um, 
exploring um, their transportation eligibility. And we've expanded our list of acceptable forms of verification. And that exhaustive list will end up in procedures, right? And so families can submit their expired ID. It can be a photo ID um, from their job, from their school, from their work. Uh, as long as it shows their face and their name, we're going to be able to accept that. Many of you are already doing that. And then we made some terminology changes as well. So disability of parent and disability of child will now be known as special need of parent or special need of child. And for our special need of parent, we've increased their approval up to three years. And my favorite line is on the bottom of this slide, which is we're gonna just trust and believe, right? We're gonna trust and believe what families put in front of us, right? What they put in front of us, what they represent um, as their family. So I'm gonna pause. Do, do folks have any questions? I know there was a lot in the chat, but I was focused on taking yeah. my time. So Tyrese, a lot of questions on um, whether things are in effect now, um, updating forms, wanting to know like when they have to do certain key key things. So when you say full-time care is 25 plus a week, do you mean children need to attend a minimum of five hours per day to be considered full-time? Or are you referring to the service need has to be 25 hours um, per week? The service the service need has to be 25 hours per week. Uh, Stephanie, you had a question? Oh, thank you, Carmen. You had already replied, sorry. Stephanie, I see your hand. I don't can know you if you away. I can now. Okay, sorry. Um, I just want to confirm. Sorry, my dog in the background. The old man's here. <laughs> um, so the policies that you're referring to, we're still just going on the, um, oh my goodness, I forget the name of it. It's not the, the, just the small list of the things we're supposed to be following now. Even though yeah. you've listed these things here, we're still not following those. Until... So the things on, there are just some things that aren't updating in CCFA yet, right? So the self-employment will require training. Right. I just learned that it's the CCFA has been updated where it's collecting a month, but we want to be able to train and answer all your questions. Self-employment, it should be less complicated for you. Right. But we want to be able to train you on that. We know that self-employment would not we would not be able to fully train in this session because we won't have enough time. Every, some of what we're, we've decided is based on timing. So those two things are not yet. The provisionals changing to 12 weeks, we cannot change that right now because CCFA hasn't been updated for the 25 hours full-time and we wanna make sure families can still receive the full-time care. So for many of you, you're, if you had a family that was at that was at 27 hours, right? Or even at 25, you've been giving them provisionals. And so we don't wanna, and those provisionals now are 26 weeks. We wanna make sure we can get families um, who should be full-time in the system as full-time and not seeking before we change um, the provisionals. And we also need to be able to inform families of the change. Sorry, so I just wanna make sure I'm clear and understand what you're saying. So some of those things that you've listed that weren't in that, and I'm again, I keep forgetting the name of that. The policy once, advisory. The policy, thank you, policy advisory. Even though then those things might not be listed in that policy advisory, we are now going to be doing some of those things that you listed today that we can yep. follow. So I can tell you specifically, like for income for homeless families, that's already waived. You can do right. that. Young parents, you can already do that. It's increased to 25. Yeah. Domestic violence, homeless, substance abuse, they qualify as a service need. You can already do, you should, you can already do that. Homeless families, you put in as homeless and homeless. Families experiencing substance abuse or domestic violence, you can put them in now as special need, right? You can put them in as a special need. The system hasn't been updated to include, we're gonna include in CCFA substance abuse and domestic violence, 
but my understanding is how you've been, how many have already been doing it for substance abuse in the past was using special need of parent. The provisional is not, right? Provisional is still 26 weeks. Families submitting up to 26 weeks of um, income within the last 26 weeks, that's already updated in CCFA, so you can already do that. Child support, um, the removal of child support, TFDC, SSI, and SSDI, you should already be doing that. You don't have to include that in CCFA. You're not collecting it. The employment verification, you can... Um, you can offer them now a provisional families with new employment or using the EVF to verify the employment. You can uh, you can give them 12 months now. So you can offer them the option. Kelly, I, I see your hand. I'm just going through the list. Um, active military deployment as a service need and activity for the family. That's being updated right now. I'm not sure it'll allow you to do it fully. It allow you, military is there as a service need, but it may look for something else. So for the self-employment, um, do we can, we don't have to collect the receipts for the expenses any longer? You don't. Okay. And that can start now. So I want you to wait because I want to be able to fully, we want to be able to fully train you on it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We want to be able to fully train you on it. You want to be able to fully train you on it. Okay, Kelly, you can um you can ask a question. Sorry. I saw somebody else, Cindy. I don't know if she was first or if she still has a question. Oh. Let me let me, me look. I, I lowered my hand. I oh, lowered my hand because you're kind of answering it. I just wish you had a list of effective now, effective later, instead of like going through it one by one. <laughs> That's what's confusing me. So you want a list that says effective now. So the only things on here, I and I when we send out the slide deck, we can we can make sure there's a list that say that says effective now, effective later. We can do that. Okay, so now I'll ask my question. <laughs> um, I I just want to get clarification on the no Google Maps for travel. Does and I understand that we can add travel now to make sure they can get the full time if they're at 25 and not 30 because CCFA is not ready. But is that a general, is that going to be a general rule in terms of we can add five hours of travel, whether or not they really have five hours of travel to help them get to the eligibility level they need? Or, or, or is it like a self-attestation? Yes, it takes me five hours a week to do this travel. Like, I guess I'm just trying to understand the distinction. So, you know, look, I'm going to yeah, no. So you probably are going to guess, I'm going to push this question out to you, right? If a family, if I live, if my child's childcare program is two blocks down the street, that is not an hour. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. And so some of it is going to be you using so, what you know and okay. the other, yes. You just said it. Some of it is going to be common sense and some of it's going to be believing what a family, trust and believing what the family tells us. So it's not, it's not just a gimme. It is, we can do it, but we don't have to do that extra step of the Google Maps. Correct. We don't have to do that extra step, but we, we, you got to ask how long does it take to get to your, your child's program, right? Yep. But then does my that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Like we're, we're not saying it. like, oh, we just, you should add it to help a family get um, to full time, we're saying like if you 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 either have it either takes you an hour or doesn't or it takes you close to an hour. With if if you live in certain city, if you live in the city of Boston, let you me just say, <laughs> let me just say this. I remember, you know, I'm a Bostonian girl. I I hate coming to the city because something that should take five, 10 minutes, it will take you 30 to 45 minutes to get there. And so you have to consider these things, right? Google Maps is not gonna do that for you. Okay. But Google then Maps is not gonna do that. 
And you, you know, we know that. So yeah, it's just going to be what you know, Kelly. Okay. My follow-up question is, I do want to understand that by adding the travel time, it has always then disallowed them from also getting transportation on their voucher. And that will that still remain in effect? I don't understand that. So I think we have to, you, I'm going to, I'm going to say this again, people over processes, what's in the best interest of the family? Because I would say to them, if you're, if like, if you need, like, yeah, you, you got to inform yeah. the family of what their options are, right? And let the educate, educate, educate. I hear what you're saying, Tyrese, but I will just mention it is a technical thing. If I add travel in CCFA, CCFA will not actually let you also add transportation to the voucher. It is a one or the other thing. I'm hearing from you that it it does it shouldn't necessarily be. So that would be something to think about as a technical issue. Yeah. So I would ask you if when you're when you're talking to the family about it, how do you talk to them about it? What, what you know technically has to happen. So that's I'm just saying. I know there are these things technically that have to happen, but I also know the pe the person in front of me. So if I, if the parent in front of me is saying I need, yeah, it takes me this amount of time to get my child to the program and also it and also I need transportation and I know as the provide I know as the family access administrator I can't do both mm -hmm. and that program that that the parents going to have transportation I'm probably going to pick the transportation over giving that parent those five hours and that is exactly the conversations we have but I will just yeah. mention there have been there have been actual legal cases where there's been a fight between the two and I'll leave it at that and we can discuss it at another time <laughs> but if you're doing what's you do what's right for the family right I did yes GBLS fought harder to have them be allowed both well, it's something we can note that it's a technical thing. It doesn't all the the system doesn't allow the two options. It doesn't allow you to click the two options. Excuse me, Tyrese. Yes. You may have already answered this and I may have missed it, but when CCFA updates to the 25 hours being enough for full-time care, a family that has like let's say 23 hours. Would we still be able to give them travel time to get them to the 25 to keep them at full time? If the only if they're eligible for the travel time. Okay, so that that policy will still still mm -hmm. be there. Yeah, the policy is there, right? The policy is there. We're just saying we're not asking you to use Google. You don't have to use Google Maps to help to determine whether they get that additional, right? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other? Yes. Yeah, so Lynette, your question, if a family works 20 hours per week and have five hours of travel time, then the family um, will qualify for full-time care. Yes. Yes. You stated that families families will now have a limit for provisional authorizations. Will they be affected now that we add seeking to a family that has 25 hours and not be able to get a provisional at a later time? So provisional, the new, the shift to provisionals has not started yet. That's not effective yet. That's not effective yet. So any family that has a provisional, it will be looking ahead. It won't be looking back. We will not be counting past provisionals. We'll only be counting the provisionals moving forward from the date that we the date that we make the provisional change. Uh, Marlene, and then I'm gonna move forward through the slides and we'll open it up. I wanna remind folks that the drop-in sessions will allow you to ask more detailed questions as well. I gotta be quick. Yes, yeah, it's about the third party verification. If we have a family that has both parents in the birth certificate and they are under three under three, so what paper they should bring in order if they let's say the father doesn't live with with them anymore. So what we should add. So you're gonna go by what the family puts on their app what they put on their application. Are you saying that they present it as a co a complete household and then they then the dad moved or oh then in the beginning going, they, but, in the beginning the, the father is in the birth certificate, yes. So we're not asking, we're not asking where the father is. It's it's not our right. business. 
right? The birth certificate is proving age in relationship to the parent applying. And that we're gonna go over that shortly. So I'm gonna just go back to share my screen. Yep, you're gonna believe exactly what they're saying. Right? Thank you. Believe what they say. So what you see in front of you is just the, the high level eligibility overview, right? The family submits their application. Um, they submit their application. The family submits their documentation, right? All their documentation. The family access administrator reviews the documentations and the family's either determined eligible or ineligible, right? The family's de determination period, and this might feel really new for you, must be no later than 10 days following the day the family has provided all necessary documentation, right? All necessary documentations. And so when we talk about completing a family's eligibility, it's their eligibility for childcare financial assistance. We're not talking about confirming their provider in this, right? You have 10 days from the time the family submits all their documentation to determine whether they're um whether they're whether they're eligible or not. Does that make sense? Thumbs up. I can see some folks. Okay. So eligibility verifications, we're, we're verifying identity, relationship, household composition, residency, citizenship for the child seeking care. We're making sure we're checking their assets, their verification of income or service need, and then verification of the age of the child. And so our first, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to check the identity of the parent, right? We're not looking at anything and we're looking at from the parent just what their identity is. They're either going to submit a photo ID. It can be an expired photo ID um, from anywhere that's listed here, right? It can be a passport, a driver's license. It can even be a foreign driver's license, a work ID. It just needs to have the parent's face on it and, their, and at least their name, right? You need to be identified, be able to identify that it's that parent. And if they don't have a photo ID, then they could submit any of the two from the list here, which is the birth certificate, a public benefits award, right, that has that parent's name on it, a school ID, school records, medical records, and there may be other forms of um, written document, written letters or um, maybe policy documents that has the address and the, and the parent's name on it. So we know our household composition, it determines the how it determines who's in the family. The household composition, it refers to those who uh, the parent is dependents that the parent is responsible for and who in that family, right? Whose income in that family is contributing uh, to that actual household. So that it's gonna be the parents and caregivers in the home, the dependent children, right? And dependent relatives who reside in that same household, right? That are part of that actual family, that actual family unit. Right? We know that the family household composition is what it, it should be based off what the family reports, right? Who the family reports um, in that household. You see in this red box, we're highlighting that family's composition will be de determined by what the family reports, what the family reports. So if the family reports, if I'm a mom, I report it's me and my two children. I'm going to believe that parent that it's me and my two children. And then families are going to provide their documentation to verify the relationship. So in most cases, it's going to be a birth certificate. If it's a, a caregiver or a guardianship situation, it's going to be court documentation. Sometimes it may be information from the school. Mass residency is pretty um, simple. You just need to prove that they live in Massachusetts. They can do that by providing any of these documentations that have their address on it. Um, people have asked, what does, I, you don't see the word current here, right? You don't see the word current. We wanna believe what families show us. We hope that what they're showing is the actual address to where they live at. So if they're submitting a utility bill 
or uh, a utility bill or vehicle documentation in those ways, as long as it has the family's address and confirm it confirms their residency. So citizenship, we've talked about this a number of times, but I wanna highlight here is that is citizenship and immigration status for the child seeking care, right? For the child seeking care. If their eligibility stat, if their if their immigration status is questionable, you are not going to turn that family away. You're gonna submit, you're gonna say to that family, give me whatever it is that you have. Whatever it is that you have, you give it to me and I will and will and allow e and send it to EEC and allow EEC to make the decision. What we do is we are lead someone from our legal team will review um, whatever documentation is submitted, and then we'll make a decision if that family meets immigration status. Unfortunately, immigration status is the one area where we have no ability um, to waive um, for to waive for for families for eligibility. Assets, pretty simple. Families' assets cannot. They they're just gonna attest that their assets are not um are not are below a million dollars. I find it hard to believe that folks that we would have many families where they may have that, but they're actually just going to attest to that. We talked about the shifts in the change, the shifts we, the changes that were made to what um, income sources accountable versus non-countable. Here is just the list, right? The non-countable incomes you'll see at the top are the ones we recently removed, which are child support, in-kind support, social security or SSDI. Uh, you also see here income from legal guardians, foster parents, caregivers, dependent children. Um, and so on and so forth. And then I'm gonna turn over household income and calculation overview to Carmen um, to take it over from here. Um, household income and the calculation has not really changed, right? We already have reviewed that families need to come in at or below 50% of the SMI. And the, the exceptions to that is a family that may have a child with a disability and a family that is um, has an ECE provider, right? Those, those, pam those families can enter in at up to 85%. Um, can someone go to the next slide, please? Um, we've just included a couple of examples here and of how to calculate income. And we've just included weekly and biweekly because this hasn't changed. We do know that um, we also calculate uh, bimonthly and monthly. Um, but this is just pretty much a breakdown of how you would calculate it to determine someone's um, income. Next slide. Calculating minimum wage. Um, the good part about this is that Massachusetts is not increasing it every year as it has in the past few years. So minimum wage right now is $15 an hour in Massachusetts. If the family is working in Rhode Island or any of the bordering states, um, they, you would base the minimum wage on that state. Um, so this is just a slide showing you how to calculate and how to determine if a family is earning minimum wage, right? Um, if a family is not earning minimum wage, what we ask is that you do the calculation. For example, the, the middle box shows you cash or personal check. It shows that while the the EVF that they received says that they were working 30 hours a week, they're not earning minimum wage. So we would ask that you um, issue a provisional with the 20 hours of service need that they have confirmed. And then the remainder in seeking approved activity. 
Um, you should also educate your family and let them know, you know, speak to your employer. Many times it's an oversight and the employer will bump up their wage. Okay. If at any time that does not happen, please make sure that you reach out to EEC. You know, families should not be terminated because they are not earning minimum wage. You should please reach out to EEC if they've already, you know, if you've already given them the provisional and everything, um, reach out to EEC for further guidance. Carmen, what about if they live, if they work in another state? Yep, if they work in another state, as I said, Rhode Island or um, New Hampshire, the bordering states, they have different minimum wages. So you would definitely go by that minimum wage, not Massachusetts. Next slide, please. So here we're just reiterating service need is now 25 hours per week. And of course, Tyrese has already said that um, that that change has not taken effect in CCFA yet, but this is the, the change we're working on. And that the part-time service need is 20 hours to 24 hours. And that travel time may be added. And as she said, parent works across the street. You can't add five hours of travel time, right? Um, parents that do not have a valid service need, for example, someone is working 18 hours. That is not a valid service need. A valid service need for EEC is 20 hours or more. So if a family does not have a valid service need, you would enter it as 18 hours or whatever the hours they're working or in school, 18 hours, let's say, as employed, and then the remainder would be seeking to allow them that provisional to either increase their hours or get another job, um, anything like that. Okay. Next slide, please. And you can always combine service needs. Um, that has that has not changed. Um, a parent that's working two jobs. You can combine their hours to, um, you can combine their hours uh, to qualify them for a full-time service need. Working and in school, you can combine those. As um, previously stated, parents that have a disability are now able to combine a service need. If they can only work a certain amount of hours, you, you can combine both of those, that is now allowed, okay? And as I said previously, a valid service need is at least 20 hours. So if they do not have a valid service need, you can combine with seeking approved activity. A parent that has at least 20 hours of service need cannot be issued a seeking approved activity to bring them up to full time. You can do it now because CCFA has not been updated, but once CCFA is updated, then that rule will kick into place. Any questions? Next slide, or I think we're close to lunch. You're on mute, Tyrese. And we are one minute to 12.30 as well. And um, this last, I think this is the last slide, but I'm not sure. Um, this just is reviewing what types of service need are um, EEC approved. Um, and then that on the left, it's pretty much the same. As, as you can see, we've changed maternity or paternity leave to parental leave. Um, and on the right, it's families experiencing or having experienced domestic violence and homeless, a disability of parent and substance abuse and disability of child we include there, but want to stress that that is not a standalone service need. Um, that a child that has a disability, the parent has to have at least 20 hours of their own service need um, to qualify. 
And then there's always seeking approved activity. Does that make sense to folks? Okay. Can I ask you a quick question? Sorry. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yep. Um, how much notice are we going to be given once the new um changes go into CCFA on this 20 hour and 25 hour um part-time full-time service need? I know you uh, said it wouldn't be looking back at previous authorizations, but I'm wondering if we can give our families some warning that, you know, these are the new hours coming down and um, to be a little more prepared for that. Um, when you say be more prepared, are you feeling like the like the families will will be impacted in a negative way or help me understand? Well, I think they're going to be impacted where they're not going to be able to get full-time care because a lot of them could be working like 21 hours and they just said we cannot add, we won't be able to add seeking activity on to those families, right? To get them to 25, mm -hmm. right? Carmen said that, I think. Yes, and then um, if, if a lot of these families have transportation, so, um, you know, we can't, then we're going to be stuck with, you know, trying to give them travel time to get them to 25 hours. Yeah. So they can Currently, maintain. though, for some of those families, they're not, you. what you're saying, for many of those families, they, they're getting, you've been adding seeking because they don't have another activity. Yes, right, right, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, again, so, because of the technical issue of adding the travel time and also giving them, um, transportation, you're kind of handicapping them really in both ways. So I'm wondering if we couldn't, I'm just saying it's, I don't want to wake up on a Friday and see that there was something put into EEC, um, CCFA, and now it's been changed. Um, so any family that has a seeking, any family that has a pro, any family that has seeking are going to receive notification that there's going to be a change, right? Most of the changes that we're making is expanding access for families. So that's why I was asking the additional questions because currently that means those are families who we've been using are provisional, right? To yes. get them to um to get them to to get them to full time. We still have to have, we're gonna have to educate and talk to the family. So they will receive notices from EEC saying that it's gonna change but you're also gonna to have to educate your families as well. So we'll make sure that there's at least a 30 day notice for you to have a separate, so that you, you'll be able to have a separate conversation with your families. My hope is that for some of those families that are at 21, if they have the ability to add transportation, then they're adding it. My understanding is we made transportation easier. Some families using Google Maps, they weren't eligible. And some of those families will now be eligible because we're going to believe that depending on where you live at, it can take you an hour, even though it's less than half a mile. Right. I, I agree with yeah. that. And that's a great thing that you're making it easier for that. I, I agree. Yeah. In turn, we cannot add that because we cannot add that on and then in turn give the family um transportation for their child to and from care so but currently you can't time. do that right i'm not saying we're not going to be able to do that what i heard is that ccfa so you heard a, this you heard someone else saying ccfa doesn't allow it right, right. like you, they, you have to select either or i'm going to go back and look at that but wouldn't that currently be what the families the family currently isn't dealing with it because we've had unlimited provisionals that's what i'm hearing is that what i'm hearing yeah, you say pretty much yeah, yeah. it's been yeah. unlimited provisionals right and that yeah, we have to change yeah right yeah um and this is going amy this is going back to previous policy right where right. a valid service need you couldn't add the seeking approved activity so yeah i almost forgot all the previous but yeah i remember yeah. <laughs> also um when you say you're going to send out a notice to the families is there some way that we as a contract provider can have some sort of reporting tool that will give us um, that same information so we know who you've reached out to we can do our own follow-up um 
we don't really have a way of tracking that right now as far as so anyone we communicate we will make sure we get you a we're, we're basically it's going to be a list right we we're, right, right. you know it'll be probably an excel list that's what i currently have so i have an excel list that tells me by program who is who so yes we're gonna we can get that out to you oh perfect thank you, you have an excel list that tells you that right now i know from by provide by family access administrator the countable, the the income types that we're no longer counting. I can tell you which families have parent fees with those income types. And I can also tell you how many of your families have the provisionals. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 uh, the first thing you just mentioned, is that available to us through CCFA or is that something you're going to- It's gonna not through CCFA. It's not avail It's not a report that anyone can query. It's a, it's a report we had to specially request. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So we're just going to close out. We were talking about uh, types of service needs, and we're going to close out and talk about documentation and communication with the family. Right? Uh, communicating with the family throughout the family journey and that as, re as it relates to eligibility determination is very important, right? We're asking that family access, access administrators, you make sure that you're setting up time with the family, right? Set up time to meet with the family based on their preferred method of communication. You should be asking, how do you prefer for us to communicate with you? We know that some families prefer in-person. If they'd like an in-person, let's set up an in-person. If they like to do it on Zoom, you know, virtually, let's set up virtual. Or if they prefer um, to do it via phone, you can set it up via phone. You wanna ensure that you're maintaining a communication log in the parent's file. You wanna document, you want to document communicating with the family, what happens, right? What was shared with the family? What was provided with the family? When did they submit certain types of documentation? If they needed something additional, you want to, you want to write, you want to document what um, you've discussed with the parent or what you've done with the family's case. And then you want to ensure that all documents are signed and they can be signed electronically unless the family wants to come in and sign. And you always want to give parents um, copies of whatever they sign, right? You want to make sure they have copies and that they read it. And even if they're not reading it, you're explaining to the parents what they're signing throughout the process. And then you're going to also assist families as needed. You know, you're going to assist them and you're going to assist them and educate them um, as you're moving them along throughout this process. 